All right, good morning, everyone, students, staff, faculty, uh, anyone in the community that may be watching, and thank you for tuning in and joining us here for the third annual Unity Summit sponsored by Student Council. We started this event three years ago with a couple of goals in mind. The first goal being an opportunity to empower our students to be able to work directly with the leaders of the building with the goal of trying to see the changes that students want in their building to come to life. Um, goal number two, get a real life experience of what it takes to make changes, whether it be in your community, in your college, in your school, or across the whole country. And that process can take a long time, uh, it can take a lot of conversations, it could be a lot of hard work, but in the end, this is how you get stuff done. And this is how change happens. So even though today may seem somewhat inconsequential for some of you because it's only your high school, um, what you're doing today and the skills that you're learning, these are what you're going to take with you in the real world to advocate for the things that you need. So the goals for today are very simple. We have a panel up here, Mr. Swirling, Mr. Castro, Mr. Playa, Mr. Cardone, and Mr. Marrero. Uh, we may be joined by a few more as well. I'm Mr. Grice. I am the, uh, doc I'm sorry, Dr. Cardone. <laughs> um, I'm Mr. Grice. I am the Student Council Club Advisor, and I'm honored to be here with you today. Uh, what will happen is our student leaders of the building, and these students were handpicked as uh, varsity captains, co-captains, club presidents, vice presidents, treasurers, and, and so on, uh, secretaries. You guys are handpicked to be here to represent the student body and everyone else in the school. And the goal is to bring up the concerns, the questions, the comments, the suggestions that you have for the changes that you would like to see for your building moving forward. Uh, we are going to do this in, in a respectful manner, in a professional manner. Um, understand that you may not get what you want. It may not be done today. It probably won't be done today. But this is where the conversations first occur, and then we can build on it from there. Uh, we are here to work together. This is not you guys are down there, the teachers are up here, and it's a power struggle. This is working together as a group to try to make things better in our little corner of the world known as Amityville High School. So thank you so much for being a part of this. We look forward to what you have to say. And um, without further ado, I'm going to introduce the principal of the high school, Mr. Edward Platt. Good morning, everyone. We're good? We're, we're, it's hot on here, Paul? All right. I don't hear it. Uh, you don't have this. Right. Yeah. Good morning, everyone. Um, once again, thank you, Mr. Grice. Uh, incorrect in saying that this is the third annual um, summit. And I believe, you know, when they first came up to me and, and asked if they can have, of the students asked, and uh, my, I don't think I took more than a second or two to respond absolutely, because this is how you do get things done. So I want to uh, commend the students for putting this together and advocating for themselves, um, because you know life is very, very, very busy, and sometimes things just happen too quickly, and if you don't advocate for yourself, you don't get the changes that you need. So this is completely student-driven. Uh, the students put it together, they organized it, they did everything. We, the adults over here, just showed up. So uh, once again, I just want to thank uh, the great students out here for advocating for yourselves and for all of the students um, of Amityville. And I just wanted to echo on what Mr. Grice said, that this is not inconsequential, uh, even if you're a senior and you're graduating. It's not inconsequential because it's just gonna be a change in Amityville or in the high school because any positive change you make anywhere has a ripple effect on positive changes everywhere. So don't think what you're doing for one second isn't gonna make a difference anywhere else except for Amityville because every positive thing that you do has a ripple effect and makes a positive change somewhere else. So without further ado, I wanna thank my colleagues for showing up. They're busy, their days are busy. Um, thank you guys very much. And uh, let's get started. Hello, uh, my name is Misha. Um, so I'm going to start. I have my, my whole list here. So I'm going to start with the, with the hard one, I think. So, Avenue is typically regarded as having rules that are more lax than other high schools. Do you agree with this characterization? Just, just repeat that again. 
Sure. Question. Amityville is typically regarded as having rules that are more lax than other high schools. Do you agree with this characterization? Well, uh, I would probably, yeah, I would have to disagree with that categorization because every single place is different. And I'm not really sure who typically regards that. So, yeah, I would disagree if that's your question. Sure, anybody else? No? You're asking us our opinions. Yes, here, right? yes, okay. yeah, I'm not, your opinions, yeah. Everybody agrees, with Mr. Playa? Yes. All right, thank you. Hi, my name is Christopher Blanchard, and the question I want to ask is about the bathroom limits and them causing a line. Is there like any plan to like change that, revamp that, make it any better? Well, you know, I'll apologize up front for the inconvenience, but if you've ever been to a baseball game, a football game, a soccer game, a concert, anywhere where there's a building with a thousand people in it or more, you're gonna have to wait online for a bathroom. Um, Usually the bathrooms in those places might be a little bit bigger, but you're gonna to have to wait online. So it's a coping mechanism. It's an inconvenience. Uh, the reason why there are lines to the bathroom are really safety measures for various reasons. We don't have um, enough people to monitor all of the bathrooms, so we have to limit which bathrooms kids can go to. So that's the, really the reasoning behind it. I'm sorry it's an inconvenience, but when you're in a building with over a thousand people, there's going to be a line sometimes. All right, thank you. You're welcome. Mm -hmm. I'm Terry Holman, and I'm following up the bathroom issue. So most of us understand why there's only one student allowed in the bathroom at a time. Um, do you like to, to the previous things that have been happening? Is there any plans on making it more accessible, like for more bathrooms to be open or anything like that? Because what I've noticed is I don't know which bathroom is open. So it is taking me 15 minutes to half an hour of taking outside of class time just to find an open bathroom, let alone standing in line to use that bathroom. So is there like any kind of plans to like fixing that? There, yes, and there has been plans all year to try to address those issues. Um, and the major hurdle is staffing and not having enough people to um, post at those bathrooms. So we've tried all year long and we just can't get um, the staffing that we need. And it's, it's more complex than you think, right? You think we just kind of show up and things just happen. So every, on any given day, we don't know how many of our hall monitors are gonna even be at work. We don't know how many of our security guards are gonna be here. Um, so every single day, Dr. Cardone, he oversees our security. So he has, a he has a plan, whether there's eight guards, seven guards, six guards, five guards, and oh man, we only have four guards today. So, and this is every morning. Like most of the world is still sleeping before 7 a.m. And Dr. Cardone is already trying to organize the shortage all over the building. So that is the plan to get more staff uh, and to constantly try to put people in the right spots on the bus. Um, and we've addressed it all year long. So I also do want to let you know that the bathrooms on the second floor in the south wing and north wing are always open. Uh, something like if there's a flood in the bathroom, it has to be closed. Like we've had issues with the second floor north wing bathroom where that bathroom would have to be closed, you know, due to, you know, a flood or so sometimes they're not closed. They just can't be open at times. I've gone to the second floor bathrooms multiple times and they've been closed with just nobody standing out there in general. So they're not always open from my observations and from what many other students have been talking to me about. And, and again, a reason for that could be, anything could have happened. Someone could have went to lunch, someone could have had to, the person who was watching, might have had to have gone to the bathroom. Uh, maybe they had to leave early. And there have been occasions where that has happened or someone had to leave or someone on an emergency, and then we have a 
a vacancy somewhere. We don't even know about it because, you know, in an emergency, sometimes you've got to run out and then you think about all the other stuff afterwards. So that has happened. So again, trust me, these aren't things that we're not aware of. These are not things that we don't try to address on a daily basis. And I'll go even further than that, that these issues have occurred in every single building uh, across Long Island, in every single high school. And I know that because I'm on a listserv with you know, 108 other principals, um, and we're constantly talking about little things like this that you would think high school principals aren't talking about or thinking about. Uh, bathrooms and things like that. But it's a problem uh, all over the place. And some days the problem is worse here, other days it's not. So we are doing our best to address it, and we're going to keep doing our best to address it. Um, so anytime we're made aware that the second floor north bathroom or south bathroom is not open, we, we put someone there. Uh, but what we will do is reinforce with, with security to let us know uh, if someone is not there, uh, because there is always a plan for someone to be at each station. Um, so we'll make sure that, you know, hopefully that communication gets to us. But I promise you, those, there is always someone scheduled in those two areas. We'll just make sure that that communication loop gets to us quicker, okay? Okay. And, and again, I think ideally we would have someone in front of every single bathroom every single day. Kids could, multiple kids could go in at a time and it would be convenient for everyone. That would be our ideal plan, but sometimes it just doesn't work out that way. Thank you. Hi, oh my gosh. Hey. Uh, hi, my name is Kayla Smith. And as we know, uh, people believe that in school, uh, mental health should be prioritized and definitely talked about and more accepted as many teens come out against it, come, come out with their struggles with mental health. Do you believe that this high school does a good job prioritizing mental health? Uh, I think we do a good job, absolutely. Do I think we could do a better job? Absolutely. Um, I could tell you some of the things that we've instituted here since the beginning of time. Amityville Memorial High School has only had one social worker. Uh, we now have two, which has essentially doubled the, <laughs> doubled the amount of social workers historically in Amityville. Uh, and another one is starting the day after next week as well. So I was able to, you know, with the support um, of everyone else, of course, be able to hire two more social workers. Um, hiring additional an additional guidance counselor for next year as well actually more than one guidance counselor for next year as well um so i think we've you know i think we underestimated what covid um the effect of covid had on a lot of people i think a lot of people underestimated it and i think some we flattened the curve that we've flattened the curve in some areas um, and some students have adjusted, and they're, they're okay. It took a while. But I still think we've un we underestimated um, what happened with COVID, and we probably could have used a little more support staff, um, which is why I've asked for it throughout the year, and I'm finally getting some now. Um, and more next year as well. S the district district-wide, we're also involved in a few different things to address uh, mental health issues in all buildings so that there's a vertical alignment throughout the district. So I guess to go back to your question, uh, are we doing a good job? Yeah, good. Good. I would prefer great, but it's not anyone's fault that it's not great. Uh, I think my team does a fantastic job. We do our best every single day. Uh, can we do more? Absolutely. So at one point during the year, Terry had actually come to me and said that she wanted to kind of have like a mental health group, right? Um, so that was something that uh, Ms. Noon and I discussed with the rest of the support staff and the rest of the guy. Uh, we spoke with Mr. Uh, Suckle about it, Mr. Ply about it. We made, I want to say about a week's worth of announcements. Um, and the day that kids were supposed to come down so that we could start having this kind of committee about how we could address, no one showed up, not one student. 
Um, so it kind of just fizzled out from there. So like, I think that personally, I would love to see you guys be more active in creating a more positive culture for mental health awareness in the building. Um, because I think that, you know, uh, some of you see me, right? So some of you guys come to my office, you know, I think that it's positive to be involved in, in a counseling support, you know, capacity. And I think the more other kids see that, that, you know, they'll be more, you know, apt to come to, you know, seek out help. But we need your help to do that too. Yeah, and because another a student came to me as well, it wasn't Terry, it was another student who has since moved to Florida about a mental health group. And I, you know, and I told, I said, I'm all for it. Um, so pr give me a proposal, tell me what you want to do. And I brought it up with our support staff. And like Mr. Marrero said, I made announcements every single day uh, for a little over a week. And I think the announcement was any students interested <laughs> in discussing or addressing any kind of social emotional support or mental health issues, this is when we are meeting. And, and it was in, open to all students. So. We made the announcements five days in a row. No one showed up. So we just figured, all right, well, maybe we have to have, pick a, have a different venue to address that. So we also have a program with Leaders of Tomorrow called Big Brothers and Big Sisters After School, uh, run by our school psychologist, uh, Ms. Bonnie Rankin. Um, and there also is additional support there uh, through peer support and mentorship uh, from Ms. Rankin as well. And students can still sign up for that. Okay. Yeah, and, and you know, I, I hope, uh, and certainly one of my goals is that our support staff, be it guide and social worker psychologist, are accessible at all times um, to students. And if they're not, you know, I, I, I need to know, I, need, I would need to know that people are trying to see people for mental health and they're not seeing them. So, but I'm not really hearing that, you know, I'm not hearing that often. And we do have other groups that they, they run different groups and programs during the day to address uh, various mental health issues. So good job, yes, great job. No, but not their fault. Working um, on it. I also have a, a suggestion about mental health because I know that mental health to me is also very important. Um, I believe that in the school, it's great that we have in-school mental health outlets, but I believe that the school should also push for outside of school mental health outlets because some people aren't comfortable uh, going to like officials in the school. And I know like me personally, I've been like uncomfortable like expressing my feelings to maybe like a teacher or even a guidance counselor. So I feel like it's good that there's some outside of school outlets because some kids, you know, they just feel like it's too close to home to do it in school. So I'm gonna let Mr. Marrero address that. So some of your uh, peers will let you know that they don't, some kids don't come see me and I understand. Um, but anybody who needs referrals for outside, if you just come to me, you provide me with whatever insurance you might have or whatever, you know, and I, I can send out referrals. You know, let's say you want a male counselor, you want an African-American counselor, a woman counselor, I can put all that stuff into a referral sheet and I can provide you with that, or your mom, or your, you know. This one's working. But yeah, that's the long, like, if, if anybody ever needs a referral, and you can tell any of your friends as well, myself, Ms. Spady, or Ms. Rankin, we can all provide those referrals for you guys for outside counseling. Um, there's a couple of different centers. There's New Horizon, there's South Oaks that provides out, uh, patient counseling, and then private counselors throughout. So we've had some success in, pri in, pr in pr previous years um, because we don't do therapy in school, right? We do counseling in school. So for, to set you up for more long-term uh, therapy, that's something that we would refer you out anyway. Um, so if that was ever a concern, you could always come to one of us and we could help you out with that. Thank you. And that doesn't require you to tell us what we are. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. I have a, I have a quick follow-up question. Um, for like the mental health, um, I guess, committee, do you know when it was um, supposed to be held? I'd have to look back at my notes, to be honest. Okay. Was it during, do you think during the school day, after school? Do you think there's during seminar? I want to say it was like we were doing the fourth or fifth block. Mm -hmm. Okay. Do you remember saying that? I don't remember. It was like fourth or fifth block when they set it up and asked, you know, since we were going to provide passes, it wasn't, you know. Cool. Thank you. I'd have to look. 
Thank yeah, you. it was um, it was midday. It wasn't during block two. It was like Friday's period five or block five, uh, period four or five or something like that. Cool. Thank you. Hello. Uh, hello. My name is Amin, and um, it's a it's more of a double question. If that's okay with you guys. So, so just one at a time, though. We're a little, little well, slow like, to process things up here. Yeah, it's just like they're intertwined with one another. So it's just like, just to let the crowd or me know. I've heard that from my teachers and other fellow students that seminar next year is going to be replaced with another elective that period during Block Two. Is that correct? So that's our plan uh, to abolish the seminar period. And what that'll do is it'll capture a lot more instructional minutes, and it'll it'll give us basically another period a day here so we could add more electives uh, into the schedule of everyone else. So yeah, we're getting rid of the seminar. Well, that's our plan to get rid of it. Okay, so for students like myself and others taking four or so AP classes, seminar is, I think, the only time of day that I have to do all this work that I can't do at home after school because of my ex extracurricular activities and sometimes sports as well. So I feel like, I, I don't know if this is a question or a recommendation, but something to consider, I think, would be a seminar for students taking rigorous courses or AP classes for, to allow this work to be done in a consistent pace or manner. Yeah, uh, thank you for that, because that's something we really, really struggled over, because when we look at the students who are using seminar and who are benefiting from seminar, uh, are students like yourself, right, who are taking these massive caseloads, and uh, there's just not enough, there's only 24 hours in a day, right? Um, and we've, we're seeing that, yep, it's the, uh, you know, some students are really using it, and why are we taking it away from those, that, and our teachers are fantastic, and they sit with students during their lunch and when they're off periods, but we're working on um, for our schedule for next year, because we're building the schedule again for next year, um, we're working on a period during the day where not all students will have that period, just students who kind of really need that period. And it might be either some places call them zero period, some places call them 10th period, um, where either right before the official school day starts or right after the official school day ends, where it could almost be like, um, like a seminar kind of period for those students who really need it, uh, whether it's for enrichment or for extra help. So working on things like that for next year's schedule. But you brought up a really, really fantastic point where you know the seminar does get a bad rap, and I agree with the negative pieces of it, and we, you know, we saw that coming. Um, but that's something we've really struggled over. If we eliminate that, what's going to happen to those students who have these massive caseloads such as yourself? So definitely something we're thinking about. Okay, thank you. And that, that was the first question, right? No, well, I just kind of turned it into one question. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Great question. All right, thank you. Hello, my name is Ace Kenny. Um, a follow-up to um, a means of question, a question and also statement. Um, there is like some students that like also do have um, AP, but also some like freshmen like myself who also do take pre-AP, and also sometimes right after school don't have the official time to go to any extra help classes to get any of those things. And another thing um, is that some orchestra, chorus, and also band kids have their um, music in also seminar. And I've talked to some of these students, and you know they say that it seems complicated since they have their music and they're not able to have that type of seminar. Um, so if we are going to remove seminar, what like type and also how would it help the music kids? So the, the issue, one of the flaws mm -hmm. of seminar um, is that it's really not equitable because not everybody has it. Yes. So if we're going to tote this great thing that we have here, well then how come we don't have this great thing for everybody, right? Yes. Um, so that's certainly one of the issues of why we wanted to dismantle it. Um, and again, I think 
we need it for, for some students, but I don't think everyone takes an advantage of it. And when you look at schools across Long Island, right, call it seminar, call it advisory, call it study hall, whatever, whatever you want to call it, um, a lot of places don't have those empty periods um, because they want to maximize instructional time for students. So your question is, what are, you, what are we going to do for students who have, just, just repeat your question, I don't want to paraphrase for <laughs> No, it's okay. Um, so if we do get rid of um, seminar or if we do build like a different type of seminar for those students who need it, how are we going to help the music kids that um, didn't have it or weren't able to have it this year? Help the music kids with? No, since music kids couldn't help have it this year since they have the same block, right. their music schedule, right. as seminar, are we going to help them next year when we do create or cancel a type oh, of seminar? So it'll be, it'll be similar to the last response. So mm -hmm. we'd want to try to build in that period either before or after where okay. students can come and get whatever additional work they need. But you, know, you, you have to understand prior to it doesn't really affect you because none of you were in high school prior to the block schedule. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, students had full schedules. Students have always just had full schedules. <laughs> What's that? <laughs> you had, all right, COVID's thrown me off a little bit. It's like dog years with COVID, <laughs> you know. What's that? Right. Oh, yeah, 1920. The, the year of COVID was our last nine period. Yeah, see, that feels like a decade ago already for me. <laughs> it's okay. You know, it, it really is like dog year. Sorry about that. So you do know then. So you do know what a nine period day was. So when you had a nine period day, mm -hmm. your schedules were full. You didn't have an extra period during the day, right? Did anybody have an extra period to just catch up on stuff? Um. Yeah, you didn't. Well, Misha, you're an anomaly, you, you know. Most kids aren't like, I don't want a lunch period. I don't want a lunch period. Um, but you, you did what you had to do, and you, you built up that, you know, those AP classes. Um, so, yeah, when we had a nine-period day, students didn't have an extra period to catch up on stuff either. So it's not like, you know, if we get rid of this, what are we going to put in its place? Mm -hmm. Because we hadn't had it before. Okay. Does that make sense, guys? Yes. All right. Thank you. And I do remember that, Misha, when you were like, I'm not going to take a lunch period. Give me nine periods of advanced placement classes. Um, well, my question is, why would anyone opt to do a 10th period in a day when they could instead go to an extra help class for the exact class that they're needing? Well, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Um, but if the problem is that these students don't have, don't have time after school or even before school because they're involved in so many extracurricular activities, then does having a period that's outside of the school day already really help those students? Well, if you, if you have that period outside the school day, maybe at the start of the school day where not everybody, not everybody's going to come, the teacher will be here already to assist them. So you have to choose, right? We have to make choices. We can't, sadly, um, there isn't something for everyone at all times, right? They're gonna, you're going to have to pick and choose which, which extra help you're going to. You know, there's only five days in a week, and if three of your teachers have extra help one day a week, you're going to have to make a decision, all right, how am I going to work this out? Am I going to go see another teacher? So we've got to make choices, and it's, an, it's undoubtedly an imperfect system, imperfect system, which is why I am constantly in the network with other high school principals to see what works and what other people do, and to shift with the times. Thank you. Um, if you remember when, when we went to Kings Park, I think you were, you were there with us, and one of their big, why do you think it's not? You, you know, it's interesting, we're live, and I have to be completely honest, it's interesting that you've got that perspective, because when, you're, you got it. That was from the students. The students were... Yeah, from the students and the AP macro, micro teacher. Okay. The majority of the teachers and administrators there were like, see what you could do to minimize the seminar period because it's the one thing that we haven't completely mastered. And they've been doing it there for like 18 years already. 
and they were like, it's the only piece of the schedule that we are not like 100% satisfied with. Um, so they were like, you need to try to minimize that. It'll make it, your life a lot easier. And knowing that going in, why did we still push it so hard? Well, I, our, our, my plan was to do it once a week. Right. And see what would happen. Um, try once a week, tweak it. You know, is it good? Is it bad? How can we make it better? And then kind of run with it from there. Because this is brand new. You know, changing or shifting over to that block schedule is, you know, we haven't done it. Most places haven't done it. So that was really what my plan was. Um, but that plan was never able to come to fruition uh, because we wanted, you know, others wanted to try it the other way, then said, all right, let's try it the other way, and then we'll tweak, which I understand. You know, my plan was let's do it once a week and then tweak. Others had plans to do it more than once a week and then tweak. So we've done it twice a week, and now our tweak is we need to either eliminate it or do go or minimize it. So thank you. You're welcome. Hi, I'm Toby McCrory, um, and I'm a transgender student, so this is really important to me. I believe our district needs LGBT tolerance training for teachers and students. Um, this is really important to me, like for the whole district, mm -hmm. not just the high school. Um, I had an experience in middle school where I came out to two teachers, and one of them outed me to my parents because she didn't know better. I would like to prevent things like that from happening in the future. Uh, I'm sorry about that. Um, no, I'm not, I'm not like venting or anything, but I, I want this because there are it's teachers important. who it's do understand and then there's teachers who don't and they're trying their best, mm -hmm. but I think they need to understand as well. So um, I, I agree. Right, we're sharing opinions right now. We need more training um, in it. Absolutely, I'm sorry that that had happened to you. Uh, but the district is, we've got plans in place. The district is working on things. I was at a, another committee meeting yesterday. I just got um, our capstone, I just got my capstone certification from Adelphi University along with many, many other teachers in the district. Uh, our diversity, equity, and inclusi inclusivity um, program so we're going to be rolling a lot more stuff out uh, for a lot more training and and I couldn't agree with you more we need more training we need more sensitivity um, and we're working on it we're working cool on it. thank you um, there's another point I wanted to add um, I think it would be really helpful for the trans and non-binary folk of the school to have gender-neutral bathrooms um, because the problem with a lot of like trans kids and public bathrooms is they don't know which one to go in if they're gendered. And while we do have the nurse's office, I would like it to be more accessible to the rest of the school. Because some kids, you know, they may pass and they may not pass, and they don't know if they pass or not, right. if they're trans. Um, and some might be also non-binary. And there's, you know, not really such a thing of passing on as non-binary if you're not queer. So, you know, you, you're, you're saying some greats. I understand what you're saying right now, but some people, they don't even know what you're talking that. about by using the word passing and not passing, right? I know what you're talking about, um, which really... Passing as the gender they are no, I, presenting I know. as. No, I know. I, mean. you're, I know exactly what you're talking about, but you're talking about, like, LGBTQ sensitivity, and that you're, what you're saying right now, people who are listening are, might even be saying, I'm not even sure what they're talking about, passing and not passing. So I'm glad you're bringing, my point is we need more training on it. Definitely. Because I think some people are, who are watching and listening are scratching their heads and are can very confused about what you and I are ha even talking about right now. Mm -hmm. So I, I agree. Um, right now, of course, it is the nurse's um, office as a gender neutral bathroom. My goal, I think our goal uh, is to, uh, you know, make Every, again, my ideal utopian world. Every single student felt accepted, felt comfortable, was accepted, is accepted and is comfortable. 
and if that's something that we need to do here, then we're, we're going to do it. So we could sit down, have a conversation, and, and figure out which bathroom um, we're going to make gender neutral and how we're going to let students know that it's a gender neutral bathroom because that also becomes part of the problem. Um, they just don't know which, where it is or which one to, you know, where, where to go. So, but we can certainly have a conversation and if you're telling me that students aren't comfortable going to the nurse to use that as a gender neutral bathroom, we'll, we'll fix it. Cool, thank you, that's all. You're welcome. stuck. All right, good afternoon. My name is Dante Rigsby, as most of you know me. So my one concern is um, coming into the school now as freshmen, since we obviously always didn't have freshmen in the high school. So thank God that we do now, so they can feel like they're part of the high school now. So um, my one concern for them is a lot of freshmen come into the school not knowing no one, not knowing their classes, not knowing, not having that many friends, some of them coming from uh, eighth grade the year before. So my uh, concern is, if we can like create a buddy system or have a senior or junior help them and you know show them around, show them the ropes of the high school, how to you know move and meet all the teachers so they can get a better understanding of how the school functions, how everything works, and so they just are more comfortable with the school. Yeah, great suggestion, Dante, and we, we certainly fell short there. I'm not gonna say we didn't. Um, you know, we always have these great plans to do that stuff in September and October and, you know, a big buddy system and pairing every single kid, uh, every single freshman up with either another student or an adult that they're going to connect to. And that's always the plan. And then, you know, stuff happens and you don't get to it and a month goes by and you still didn't get to it. And then you get to the summit in May and you go, man, we tried to do that. And we didn't. We, we failed in that that area. Um, so it's a great suggestion. We're going to work on something, certainly something like that. We are having our incoming orientation May 19th, or May, it's either May 19th or May 26th coming up for our incoming freshmen. Um, but yeah, we, 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 weren't, uh, we weren't as prepared as we should have been. Um, I thought we were, able to, we were going to be able to pull it off. But you're right, uh, there are definitely students um, that could have used a little more mentoring. And we also have to keep into consideration our ninth graders were in seventh grade in March of 2020, right? So to all you ninth graders out there, um, they missed the quarter of their seventh grade year and they missed their entire eighth grade, normal eighth grade year. And I don't expect you guys to know and understand the psychology behind the you know, the developmental stages of students, but middle school is a key, key part of a student's experience, and we have a lot of students here, all of our ninth graders, missed a big chunk of middle school of that developmental experience, so we could have provided some more mentoring for them, and we plan on doing it next year. Yes, I remember when I started in seventh grade, my first year in Amityville. Um, I remember, I remember that too, you. Dante. Yeah, I remember meeting with you, and uh, you gave me a buddy, and. Uh, which later became my best friend, and um, he showed me the school. I met all my teachers, and I made great relationships through him and from meeting people. But so I would definitely like to see uh, more freshmen, either getting with a buddy or s with a teacher, just to guide them and show them the high school, so they can feel more comfortable and more uh, relaxed coming here, not worried, not scared, and so on. Absolutely, it's a great idea, and you know the theme, right? is you know, to feel more comfortable, more, more accepted, to fit in, and I, I'm hearing it over and over for everyone. So uh, it's a great idea, and we'll definitely get something in place for next year. Thank you. Okay, I have two questions. The first one is very important to me, as well as many other people. Why are there no women sitting with you guys? We didn't, I didn't select this committee. There, wasn't this a student, student selected committee? I think that's a great question. Uh, it's certainly a fair question. So uh, we had our student council pick teachers and they did include female teachers. Unfortunately, um, it kind of became a crazy day with several field trips, guidance counselors are all leaving to go on, on their own thing. 
And uh, between a lot of the people that we had selected not being able to attend because they had other commitments, there was also a situation of because so many people were out of the building, we couldn't get the coverage for those people. So if you notice, there's actually only two teachers that are up here with, with actual schedules. We usually have more, and uh, that's why. I mean, that's, that's a fair observation, um, but it wasn't for lack of trying. It was just something that, unfortunately, with the way things worked out, it wasn't intended that way. It wasn't an oversight, but just with scheduling today, it became very difficult to do that. Um, but your, your point is well taken, and uh, I totally understand, um, and I understand where that's coming from. But uh, if you want to put that on somebody, you can, you can put that on me. I'll take that one. Um, but uh, we'll do a better job next year. Absolutely. You know, we, uh, it was a busy day today. It's a great day. There's a lot of awesome things going on. Um, but unfortunately, this is what happened as a result. So. All right. Uh, thank you. It's not on Matt Price. It's on me. I'm the building principal. I take full responsibility for that. <laughs> I should have looked at the list. I should have made sure as representative of the, of the student body and of the building. So I take full responsibility for that. And then I'll ask my other question a little later. And you Thank said you, you had a second question, I I'll thought. ask it later. Good morning. My name is Fatima. Good morning. <laughs> and I wanted to try my best to ask you some questions. Yes. Can you speak up a little bit? I'm going to try my best to ask you questions to all of you, but because I don't get really comfortable. Just don't talking. make me respond in Spanish, okay? I'm doing my best. <laughs> okay. 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 Uh, my first question is: What things we have in like? What things are we going to have done to help better like ESL students, or what things you're planning to do to involve them in better? things in clubs and activities, and also sports. I th did, I, I'm having a hard time hearing. Did, was the question, what are we doing to do better for ESL students? To support them, to support the students. Oh, currently, what are we doing? Mm -hmm. Or what are the plans that you're going to take to help them? Well, you know, we've, every year, as our ENL um, population grows, we, we certainly try to hire more staff each year. We try to build more programs. Um, we try to make it as inclusive as possible after school programs. And it's a struggle. It's a struggle. And, and again, again, the theme, right, of inclusivity and making everybody feel comfortable. Um, and I think we're probably falling short there as well because it's this increasing population. We're not keeping up with it. Um, and can we do more to support that population, which is becoming the fabric of Amityville? Absolutely. So um, I mentioned the, uh, the, eight, the capstone program that we just, a bunch of us just got certified in, and addressing our English language learners is a big piece of it. So we're constantly looking to upgrade and do whatever else we can to support our English language learners. You know, I'm trying to do the announcements in the morning in Spanish to connect to more kids. Um, we made the website in Spanish for everybody, but then I was told, and you're the one who actually brought that to my attention. So when I, I said to you, hey, we've, we're doing all, all the announcements are now gonna be on a QR code, and it's gonna be on the website, and it's gonna be in Spanish, so everybody can access it. And then you, and I said, so I keep, you know, I'm saying that every day, is everybody getting on the QR code? And you said, well, you know, none of our English language learners are accessing the site because, you know, they, they, they're not seeing the poster or they don't understand the QR code or whatever the case may be. And your suggestion to me was you have to make the announcement in Spanish. So that's what I've been doing. And, um, Hopefully my Spanish is getting better and better each day. No one's making too much fun of me. You're I, laughing over there. Are you I'm giggling because my Spanish is terrible? I'm making fun of him. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, you know, I need you to be my eyes and ears and maybe talk to some of the students and see if, if they're listening to those announcements and they're, and they're checking out the Google site to see what's going on after school. But I, I agree, we need to support them more. We need to get them more involved to make them feel um, like they're more part of this community. Okay, so the other thing is that um, I believe Ms. Calderon and Ms. Morales uh, both lead the Hispanic Heritage Club. 
Are you a part of that, Fatima? No, I don't. Right, so I know that Ms. Morales and Ms. Calderon have been trying to do more stuff around kind of educating non-Hispanics on Hispanic heritage within the school. Um, so I think that that would be, especially if you, you, know, you have a, uh, an opportunity to reach out to your fellow classmates, that might be something you might want to join so that you could kind of advocate for these things that you're speaking to Mr. Ply about as well, right? So kind of educate them about using the QR code and how to get the announcements. Um, and there's a fair amount of staff that speak Spanish, right? Like Ms. Howard speaks Spanish. There's a, a, a couple of ENL teachers like, you know, that are able to communicate. And I think that they try their best to try to get that information to the classes, at least in my experience. And I just wanted to touch upon, I think this year we worked really hard. I think we had more students participating in clubs than probably ever before. Uh, we had a couple of unity days which focused on inclusivity. Um, we, yeah, we have uh, the Leaders of Tomorrow Worldwide Warriors after school where we have uh, you know, about 20 students coming and uh, you know, getting additional instruction after school. Um, we certainly need to keep moving forward. I'm hoping that you guys can help us with that. Uh, but you know, I think that we did you know, do some things this year to help with that as well. Yeah, so um, next year, the, even moving forward next year, district-wide, we have the, the SIF program. Do you, do you know what the SIF program is? It's a program for students with formally interrupted education, right? And it targets specifically our English language learners, um, several of whom we know they might have missed a year, two years, three years of school, and then they get catapulted into the high school, right? So the last time some students may have gone to school might have been fifth grade or sixth grade. And now all of a sudden they're in, because of their age, they're in ninth or 10th grade. And just imagine uh, the culture shock that those kids feel. One, coming to another country. Two, not understanding the language. Three, not having been in a, a formal building in a few years, right? So they're gonna need those supports. So that's being built in for next year. And that's a K through 12 district-wide initiative, which is gonna be a, a massive overhaul than what we've been doing. Hey, um, so uh, I'm Mr. Castro, um, I'm a science teacher, and I'm also the senior class advisor this year. Um, so speaking as a teacher, hopefully I can uh, give an example for what teachers experience. Um, you know, uh, if, if you're a teacher, you you chose Amityville. You know, I, I've worked in previous districts, I've, I interviewed at a lot of other places, but I chose Amityville. And when, you, as a teacher, when you when you uh, when you come here and you choose this school as your team, um, you know the students that you're going to work with. So um, we have great teachers. They they care, and this is a particularly interesting, uh, sorry, important topic for them. Um, Amityville offers programs with Malloy, and I'm actually I I finished the program before COVID. Um, so I'm in the process of getting certified in ENL. So um, as a teacher, there's opportunities to be trained um, in techniques to be certified, um, and the teachers care. You know, I mean, uh, we we work with our co-teachers to 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 uh, support the students. Can we do better? Of course. Um, and with feedback, we can we can do better at that. But teachers are teachers are trying, and, and we want to learn, and we want to do better. So thank you for your question. Yeah, we we have there's a significant amount of teachers who went into these uh, master's programs for English language learners, and again, they did it on their own. They did it because they love Amityville, because they love the kids. They didn't have to do that. So they want to learn. They want to get better at it. Um, and that's those are some of the things that we're doing sports and every clubs that we have. So um, how about we have another teacher as, a, as we have it like in class. <laughs> okay. So we have ENL students and we have like one regular teachers who teach each class, right? So then we can have an ENL student also. So this teacher can explain all ENL students like in Spanish. Because even if they attend to any clubs, they get rid of the club because Can they don't understand what's going on. You have to just speak on. up a little bit. My, I, my ears are like, I don't have very good hearing. So what she said was, if at the way that they have Spanish, uh, the Spanish-speaking person in ENL class, how about having somebody in the clubs that can speak Spanish so that the Spanish speakers are able to take part in the clubs as well? Yep. So why don't we have Spanish-speaking the advisors. Co-teachers. Yep. 
like we in, in each class that we have like ENL students, like we're like a type of separate class. For any club, you mean? Do we? Yeah, for any club. Like oh, we can have uh, two teachers there. Yeah, well, uh, you know that's a logistical issue. That's a budgetary issue. We've got, you know, thirty-five clubs. For well, thir say thirty. We'll use round numbers, right? So we have thirty after-school clubs. It doesn't mean we have sixty people. To, if we're going to have two people per club, we might not have 60 people to run those clubs, and we certainly don't have 30 people who are bilingual to do it. So it's really a logistical piece more than anything. If, if I'm answering your question correctly, why don't we have bilingual people as club advisors? Right? Is that the yeah, question? Yeah, that's good, too. Because we don't have enough bilingual people. But we have some. Yeah, we right? have so some. Like, you have and those... They almost all of them are like, like almost Ms. Whitney every, is in like five clubs. Yeah, and she speaks Spanish. Ms. Calderon, Ms. Morales, Ms. Yeah. Whitley, Ms. Howard, uh, Ms. Kevinny. Yeah. yeah, like so we do. Many of our bilingual teach fluent bilingual teachers are club advisors. Yeah, but those are like Hispanic clubs. No, are no, like I'm I'm the co I'm the co advisor of the GSA, the Gay Straight Alliance, and I speak Spanish. Mm -hmm. Ms. Whitney is part of Interact Drama Club. Ms. Kevinny is Art Club. Miss Morales, cricket crafting. So there's, uh, there's opportunities. I'm not trying to lessen it, Ms. like I understand what they might do. Uh, but at the same time, I also think there's opportunities that we don't take, right, as, as Hispanic, that some of the Hispanic students don't take also to kind of, you know, find ways to affect that change yourself. Does that make sense? Yeah. Right, like you helped when we were in our awareness weekend, right, we had somebody help Right, so that because you, your English wasn't great, so we had somebody that was able to help, right, translate. Now you're able to bring, pay that forward, right? So you could go into those clubs and kind of help some people be able to acclimate a little bit. Because the idea is not necessarily to always speak in Spanish, that's a support. The idea is so that we can communicate in English, right? So we provide both of those supports. Okay. Yeah. And I just got to give an additional shout out to Fatima over here because she has been uh, such an advocate for her peers, her, specifically her English language learner peers. Um, often students who don't have the advocacy that everybody else has. So uh, just another big shout out to her, to all, I don't know which camera to look at, but uh, <laughs> to all of our English language learners out there, next time you see Fatima, just say thank you and, and praise her because she's uh, an absolute student advocate and she's gonna do big things for this world, big things. Thank you. Um, hi, my name is Ava Tuturoni. And um, so I heard some rumors about like um, universal busing and all that. And I was just wondering if there's gonna be universal busing for everyone next year, because for some students, like they wanna do after school clubs or um, extracurricular activities, but they can't because um, they live too close, but they're not allowed to walk. So is there gonna be like any opportunities for um, universal busing for students? Um, great question. For those who don't know who universal, what universal busing is, it's when every single student is entitled to a bus. So the current rules in Amityville are if you live within 1.5 miles of, um, of any school that you go to, you don't get a bus, all right? Now, that seems pretty harsh. Um, the state regulations, and I know this is live and someone's gonna quote me on this, and hopefully I'm correct, but the state regulations, I believe for elementary school, the parameter is two miles, and for secondary, it's three miles. So while I'm not saying it's okay that it's one and a half miles in Amityville, it's still well under what the state tells us to do. Um, I believe it has been budgeted for universal busing. So your question is, are we doing it? Um, I hope so, I think so, but I am not 100% sure. Uh, we absolutely see the benefit of it. But you have to understand, guys, and this is you know, another lifelong lesson. If you're spending money here, you have to take it from here because it just doesn't grow on trees, right? So it's a, it's a budgetary question. Do we want to spend the money on universal busing? 
and then maybe take it away from somewhere else unless we could get some kind of a grant. And I believe that's what the district worked on. So agree with you. That's my opinion. We need it. I don't think students should be walking one and a half miles to school in the rain, in the snow, on 110, on Sunrise Highway, because it doesn't happen in any other neighboring districts. So it's not happening in Massapequa. I'll tell you that right now. Um, so I agree with you. We need it, and I hope we have it. All right, thank you. That was my very, my answer could have been yes or no, but it happened. give me a mic and we're in trouble. Um, my name is Ayana Haddad, and I'm asking this as a senior who takes electives. I'm wondering why we're forced, not forced, but kind of we have to fill our schedules with electives, and we can't end the day early and just take our required courses. I, that's a wonderful, wonderful question as well. Um, and I've been asking that same question now for, uh, well, two years. I wasn't really asking that so much three years ago. But I've been asking that question the same two years when I'm looking at data and I'm looking at attendance and I'm looking at GPAs and I'm having conversations with students. Um, I don't know. It's not an official policy and everyone seems to have th always thought it was, right? So what happens in any organization, things go on forever and ever and ever, and then everybody just assumes that that's happening because it's written somewhere that it's supposed to happen. Um, but we would like all students to have a full schedule, but it's not an official policy anywhere, and next year, uh, as we work on building the master schedule, there's a very strong possibility that our seniors will not have to fill their schedule with classes that they do not need. I could tell you some of the philosophy why behind it. Um, I was a teacher here when students didn't have full schedules, uh, when students did have study halls when students did have, when we did have an open campus. One, when it was a nine through 12 open campus, and when it was just a 12th grade only open campus. So I've seen all the variations of this stuff, right? What works and what doesn't. The reasoning behind having the full schedule is because you don't want, you know, uh, 100, 200 kids just walking around because they don't have the schedule because uh, the, they don't have a class. In turn, what you get is 200 kids who are walking around because they don't because they have a class that they don't need to go to or don't want to go to. <laughs> so, um, you know, it's a double-edged sword. But I, you know, I'm certainly an advocate for. I'll speak for myself. I'll speak for myself. My senior year in high school, I only needed four classes to graduate. I needed to work. I needed money, um, and I needed to work full time. So the way my schedule was in high school, the first half of the year, what well, was it? The first half or the second half? It was definitely the second. The second half of the year, my school day ended at ten fifteen, because uh, I was a landscaper at a condominium complex across from the school where I went to. So I left school at ten fifteen so that I can go work full time from eleven to seven. Um, and that benefited me, it benefited my family, and I think that would benefit students of Amityville as well, uh, where maybe seniors can come in late if they needed to come in late. Um, some seniors are going to come in late anyway, but you know what I'm saying, right? We have st seniors here who are working until then 10, 11, 12 o'clock at night, and we expect them to sh get on the bus, be at the bus stop at 6.30 in the morning. Right? We don't expect adult, adults to do that, work to, well, we don't expect all the adults to work till 11 o'clock at night and then be here at 6.30 in the morning, only some of us. Um, so I agree, you know, if a senior wants to leave at 12.30 and doesn't need a, a, a block four class because they have a job to get to, you know, maybe we need to have some leeway there. So I, I don't disagree with you and we're working towards that. And um, this is like my first and last year here. I transferred here this year from a school in the city. And you've acclimated excellent, by the way. Thank you. Um, but in my old school, 
they had 10 periods and students got to either come in early and leave early or come in late and leave late. And I feel like that would be something that's better for students because it makes more, it more accessible yep. for their And that's time. what we talked about with Misha's question, having that additional period either beginning of the day or at the end of the day. So plenty of schools do do that. Yep. So, so is that your question is, are we doing that? Like, could it be a possibility? Absolute possibility, yes. Thank you. You're welcome. I'm going to make this as quick as possible just so more people can um, get their questions answered. The first thing, um, just to Ava and everyone who's listening who wants to know about the budget, um, the busing, that's really a board question, and I know they were talking about it, they want to do it. Um, in addition to all the budget things, it's great to see everyone so excited about it. Um, they increase our budget, we're paying more taxes. They also decrease the music budget. Um, but if you're you know interested in that, excited about that, definitely go to the board meetings and ask them about it. Yeah, I don't, guys. I don't make like principals <laughs> don't make busing decisions. <laughs> Mr. You know, Ply like, doesn't have the the, the checkbook. Yeah, he, a, he, he follows a, the decisions. But it's exciting to see people that you know are passionate about it and definitely go ask the board of education about it if you're interested in it. Um, now, my question for you guys: um, the SAT school day has been seen to help minority and poverty students the most. It eliminates barriers of transportation, and we can work commitments and among other things. Schools that have implemented it have had astounding results, including a jump from 35% participation in weekdays to 95% weekends to 95% participation on weekday, weekdays, um, and a 300% increase in three years of scholarships and financial aid. As a school that's built upon minority and um, poverty-stricken students, why don't we have an SAT school day? Why don't we have an SAT school day? Yeah. Um, there were a lot of reasons that went into that decision this year, um, and certainly and last year, and COVID was a big piece of that. Wouldn't it be even more useful with COVID so we don't just um, put ourselves in other communities where we don't know about the COVID transmission rates rather than doing it in our own, our own building where we see everybody every single day anyway? Uh, yeah, yeah, I, I, I agree. Um, the last couple of years we didn't let visitors do the SA take the SATs here. Uh, this year I believe we did. But that is fantastic data that you just shared, and uh, we're uh, AP coordinator right here, Dr. Cardone. Um, we're certainly gonna look into that. And that is fantastic data that you shared. I wasn't uh, completely aware of those numbers. I knew that they were um, certainly better for during the week SAT testing, but those are pretty significant. That's a pretty significant data points that you just mentioned. I can, I can share them if you want. I can yeah, please. Share. No, that's really, and that's, and that's the great argument, right? So this is how I would present it. We're gonna shut down the school for SAT day. And then most people are gonna say, wait a second, you can't lose another day of instruction for SATs. Not everyone's gonna take the SATs. Not everyone's gonna do it now. Not everyone's ready for it. Why should we not give instruction to ninth and 10th graders because uh, we wanna shut the building down for SATs, right? And now my response is gonna be, did you know? And then I'm gonna read the data <laughs> that you just sent me, and that's the reason why. And no one could dispute that, right? Those are hard numbers. One of the, we could do that here, shut down. We could hypothetically just administer it to say 11th and 12th graders, but we don't have the room. We can't have, we can't have a regular school right. day and administer a three hour exam for all those students. We could do it for AP exams because it's a small amount of students, but we can't administer SATs or PSATs during a regular school day when there's four or 500 kids, you know, two, say right. two grade levels, 400 kids taken. It's just logistically, we don't have the rooms. Yeah. We don't have the spaces for it, but that's fantastic data. Um, and look, we have to get creative in situations like this. And if we're gonna get serious about wanting to administer an SAT um, during the school day, we have to look vertically within the district. You know, um, what else can we do? Can we put kids in another building for a couple hours and bus them here? I, you know, I know these are crazy ideas, but I've been called crazy numerous <laughs> times. Um, but if it's something that's gonna help kids, we have to look into it. We just have to. And if we're told no, or we, we see a reason why something you know, is not beneficial, then we're, we're told no. Or if I look at it and say it's not worth it, then it's not worth it. But we have to look into it. 
and on AP exams and classes, as more colleges stop accepting credit from AP exams or are requiring higher score, scores, do you guys have any plans to start looking more in depth into things like the International Baccalaureate Program or dual, more dual enrollment classes? Um, there hasn't been any conversation about okay. moving an IB program um, into Amityville that I am aware of. There are, I want to say five or six high schools on the island, not too many. It's an incredibly rigorous program. It's an impressive program. And again, you make a, another great argument, Misha, about why we need to maybe possibly look at IB programs. Um, I wouldn't discount AP. I realize that different colleges are saying different things. They also yeah. say that about the SATs, you know. Every year for the past three years, the number of colleges that, have, that are not accepting AP credit are growing. It started with Dartmouth, Caltech, and uh, you know, Amherst, Williams, and every single year, another college or two or more adds, say, we're not taking any credit at all, or making it only so it's four or fives. Um, obviously, it's not a huge problem now, because it's, you know, a certain number of schools, but when you see the trend that it's adding, it's growing every single year, you want to maybe get ahead of that so it's not, you know, if it's not 10 years from now where everyone has been thinking, oh, I'm getting all this college credit for these AP classes, and they learn their senior year of high school, oh, wait, none of them are going to apply to where I'm going. So, I, you know, I... You, you got to do either or. I mean, I think not you got to do not, either not or. Not necessarily. Um, no, or both, right? Yeah. Like, so you have to have something, right? And if we're not going to go IB, we have to go with the AP classes because although the schools that you just mentioned may not be accepting as many credits, I will guarantee you, I, I mean, I, I don't know this for a fact, but they are also not accepting kids who don't have AP classes. Like they're not gonna, you know, Williams, UPenn, Dartmouth, they're not accepting a student that has not taken AP classes. Nor do I think any kid is applying there who hasn't taken AP classes. You, you know what I mean? So while they might not be taking credits, the schools still wanna see that kids are challenged. They might say, listen, we're not giving you credit for it, but we're glad you took it. And that's what we promote here. That's what we are promoting here, that's why we have flexible open enrollment um, because we want to give everybody the opportunity to at least sit in those rigorous classes and get the shot. Thank you. You're welcome. Hello, my name is Stephanie Gutierrez. Uh, so I wanted to talk about uh, regarding the morning tech kids that they face. Is that they actually, they don't actually have a lunch period so when they do get their lunch, they have to rush to their class or eat it during class time, and it takes their time. Uh, like, and have to multitask and eat and write notes and learn. I uh, just wanted to know what we, what we can do about this. We could change the opening and closing times of every uh, building in the district, but um, that's not gonna happen. So the issue with tech and with breakfast and with lunch, it's, it's every single high school. Because you know we're shipping kids back and forth across Long Island and every high school has different, somewhat similar opening times, but it's, um, it's a problem everywhere and it's like this impossible logistical issue that no one can figure out, right? We, we could figure it out here if we changed our schedule, but we can't change our schedule because we have to have alignment with all of the other um, schools in the district, right? Northeast, Northwest, Park Ave, middle school and high school, basically the starting times start in that reverse order. So um, the only way to avoid it is change starting times, which is also something that I've advocated for, a later started starting time for high school students, which the research shows is much better for students. But if you recall, I surveyed all of you back in the winter about um, later starting times. And I asked you if you would prefer a later starting time and get out later in the day. So instead of 7 to 2, it would be 7.30 to 2.30, uh, 7.30 to 2.30 or 8 to 3 and so on and so forth. And I followed up those questions with, because the argument is, High school students have to get start earlier because they have to leave earlier, because they have to go to work, because they have to pick up their siblings off the bus. So when I surveyed 
the student body, my questions were specific to that. Do you want to start early? You want to continue 7 to 2? You want to go 7.30 to 2.30? You want to go 8 to 3? You want to go 8.30 to 3.30? And your reasoning for this, how many of you have an obligation after school to pick up your siblings? How many of you have to go to work right after school? And the results of that survey actually blew my mind. Um, I'm not going to keep it a guessing game, but almost 70% of the students who responded stated that they wanted to start early and leave early and that they did not have obliga obligations after school to, to, that determined that decision. So to me, I thought for sure high school kids would be like, no, nah, I want to come to school at 9 o'clock. That didn't happen. But that didn't happen. So. Um, and I'm not saying we're going to change start times based on what students want, because we have to do it based on what students need, right? And although the research does support uh, later start times, and Jericho High School, who has the best results on Long Island, also has the latest start times on Long Island, um, but we, right now, we're, we're going to stick with our same schedule for next year, more because of the busing issue and it's a problem in every school on Long Island. So again, another, I could have said yes or no to that. The answer would have been no. We're not changing our start time. We're gonna tweak it a little bit to make it a little bit better. Thank you. Hi, my name's Adonis. Hello, good morning. My name is Diana Marte. I'm the sophomore co-president of Warrior Nation. And I'm the freshman co-president for Warrior Nation. Thank you for giving us the opportunity to voice today. Our opinions and for allowing us to speak. We have a few questions for you guys today. Just so, one at a time, please. Okay. So my first question is, um, why don't you guys have more college fairs throughout the year? Well, we've had uh, an innumerable amount of college visits, college representatives. We've got another one coming up May 26th. Um, the reason why we didn't do it this year is because we weren't allowed to because of COVID regulations. Mm -hmm. And now that they've eased up, as soon as they eased up, we brought them in. So um, our guidance department has been truly amazing with setting this stuff up. But we do have a college fair coming up, but uh, we weren't allowed. There's your answer. Okay, thank you. Okay, I just have a question about the vending machines because I know earlier on in the year they were on all day. They shouldn't have been. But like now, I have a question because I know, like I know a couple of people who don't eat. I have a couple of friends who don't eat, like they wouldn't prefer eating school food. So a question that I have is, how come they're not like? Can they be open during the lunch periods? No, they cannot. Uh, New York State regulations, we contract with an outside catering company to provide our food, which we pay for. And since we contract with an outside organization and guarantee them a certain amount of income each day, uh, we can't put vending machines on because that would compete with our um, catering company who supplies school lunches and breakfast. And it's competition, and it's against New York State law. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, and Listen, I have we don't make, I just want to make it clear, guys. Like, I don't just make arbitrary decisions about stuff. I feel like doing this or I feel like doing that. Like, there's a real reason for that. And I feel your pain. I feel your pain. Although I think the school food is pretty good. You'll see me on the schooly Instagram page a couple times. <laughs> eating them up. Yeah. And um, not to waste your time, but I have just one more question. It's never a waste of time listening to what students have to say. Okay. But um, regarding Regents Review, I was wondering if probably next year we could start it like earlier, because like I feel like we're starting it like next week, and I feel like it's a little too late because Regents are coming up, and some people have them like June first. So it's always a sticky question. Review the idea of review. I'm a firm believer that good teaching trumps any review. Mm -hmm. All right, so I don't really think there's that incredible of a need for Regents Review when the teaching is that good. 
Um, and the research also supports like cramming in for a test is not good, it's not healthy, and it doesn't work for most students. For some it does. So we've started Regents Reviews at various times, and when we start early, students aren't coming, or not enough students are coming. Mm -hmm. um, and we, we made that decision after a discussion with, with teachers and de department chairs of when would be the best time to start it. And we came up with, you know, within a month or so of when the Regents exams start, um, so it's still relatively fresh. And the way we've structured it this year, they're doing it by topic as well. Mm -hmm. And it's not just this very general uh, review. But, you know, students should not be waiting until May to start getting ready for the Regents. Um, and teachers should be encouraging extra help all year long as well. Like, kids shouldn't just be showing up for Regents Review. Mm -hmm. You know, they should be showing up for extra help and then Regents Review. So we all will have teachers after school for Regents Review, but we're also, they're also after school for their regular extra help. Students should be going to both. Yeah, and do you guys plan on having some on Saturdays probably yes. next year? This year too. Okay. And it's starting, the dates are, are, I don't want to tell you the dates off my head and be wrong. Okay. Classrooms. They're on the classrooms. Uh, yeah, the I think there's today. four Saturday sessions for mm -hmm. not only mock, like um, mock Regents exams. Most students have not sat for three hour tests yet. All right. So we, that's why we're going to do a mock exam. So yes, yeah. we do have a few Saturdays coming up. Okay, because for example, this is like my first Regents because COVID has obviously canceled all of them. And so like, I feel like I need more review. Uh, I agree, mm -hmm. I agree. Like this is a very unique year with all these exemptions. This is the first year we're doing this, you know? Um, and we're kind of easing into it and we'll hopefully we'll learn from it from when we get our results back. Yeah, so thank you so much. You're welcome. Guys, I'm, I believe we have to be done at the bell. Uh, yes, we are yeah. finished, so I just wanted to extend a thank you to the panel, a thank, thank you. you to all the students who participated and everybody watching uh, in their classrooms at home, whatever it may be. This dialogue continues. It doesn't end here. If you didn't get your question in or you're somebody watching that has something that you think is worth bringing up, talk to anybody up here or any other adult in the building. We are all here for you, and we want to work together. Thank you very much, everybody. We'll see you next year. Thank you, Mr. Rice, and thank you to all the students for the great questions, great insight, and fantastic input.